Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this week's installment of Mini Med School. My name is Daniel Twier. A um, little bit about me. I am. Uh, I was actually born down the street at St. Mary's. Uh, grew up across the bay in Oakland. Did uh, my undergrad at Georgetown University, where I got a bachelor's in biology and a minor in English Lit. Um, so uh, remember that when you see a bunch of my typos in here, and try and disregard that. Um, <laughs> And then I did med school right here. Spent a lot of time where you guys are. Um, and I also did residency here in orthopedic surgery. I did a one-year fellowship in foot and ankle surgery at Harborview uh, in Seattle at the University of Washington. And then I've been back on faculty here since 2014. So um, minus that one stint uh, in Seattle, I've been a part of UCSF since 2002. So I've been here a long time. Um, I'm, it's my pleasure really to talk to you today about a really interesting topic in foot and ankle surgery in my world, um, talking about ankle replacements and ankle fusions and about surgery and recovery. Um, I have no disclosures on this talk. Um, and interestingly, so in this world, there's still a little bit of controversy and we'll go through a little bit of the history of these um, and what they all mean you know, towards the end. Um, but there's still a little bit of controversy about which one is better, how people do. Um, and so I'm going to start off this talk by giving you a video. And this video is actually a recruitment video. It was put out by the NHS, the National Health Service um, in England. Um, and the reason for this video is they were doing a randomized trial of patients, trying to get them to do either a ankle replacement or an ankle fusion, really trying to kind of hash out um, which one is better, which one from which do patients do better. Um, and so this video, I think, is, is a good kind of introduction to things, and it'll get you thinking about where we're going. Hello, my name's Sylvester McCoy. I'm an actor. I suffer from arthritis in my ankles. I call my arthritis in my ankles um, comedy war wounds, really, because my acting career is, was very physical. I was tumbling, falling. I'd fall downstairs just for a laugh and I'd fall out of windows again for a laugh, not realizing that years later I would suffer for it because I was really, really punishing my joints. And the pain came around when I got to about 50 and then it became almost impossible to carry on doing any physical work. So I had to get it fixed. As you can see, ankle arthritis is a disabling condition. Most cases occur after trauma, such as multiple severe sprains or fractures of the ankle. This leads to a progressive wear and tear of the shock-absorbing cartilage, and over years, the development of osteoarthritis. Ankle arthritis can also be caused by other diseases, such as rheumatism or gout, but the end result is the same. The cartilage becomes worn away, the bones can rub together, causing pain, stiffness, and can have a major impact on the quality of your life. I had to stop walking uh, socially completely. I was hardly able to walk at all. I mean, it was agony just getting across the bedroom to go to the lavatory. I couldn't even um, stand very long for washing up or cooking. It's up and down the stairs, uh, not being able to drive a car. Every year, up to 29,000 patients are referred by their GP to foot and ankle orthopaedic specialists to discuss surgery for their ankle arthritis. But only 3,000 of those ever come to surgery before surgery is considered. There are many non-surgical treatments that should be tried, such as using painkillers, changing your activity levels, weight loss and physiotherapy. Supportive ankle braces can also be very helpful. If all these treatments have been tried and you remain in pain, then surgery may be considered. The two main surgical treatments available through the NHS are ankle arthrodesis and ankle replacement. Ankle arthrodesis involves removing the arthritic joint surfaces the two bones are then held together with metal screws or plates to stop any movement and over time the two bones fuse together to become one. This can be a keyhole procedure or open surgery depending on your circumstances. In total ankle replacement, the arthritic joint surfaces are removed and resurfaced with metal components. A plastic insert is then placed between the metal surfaces to allow motion. After both types of surgery, you are likely to need a plaster or a boot for up to three months and may be advised not to wait bare for the first few weeks. This will mean crutches or a frame to get about. 
Every patient is different and your surgeon will discuss the most appropriate post-operative plan for you. Both ankle arthrodesis and ankle replacement can offer excellent results and improve your quality of life. I can certainly cycle happily, swim happily. Uh, you know, I was doing 20 mile walks quite happily. I can do my own shopping, which it was getting that because of the weight carrying shopping, I couldn't do it. There's very little that I can't do now. I'm back doing my 20 mile walks a week uh, and, and I'm, I'm absolutely no problem. I'm walking very well and uh, without a limp, with total flexibility and, and now it's the time to see whether, like all retired people, I can take this up as, a, as another hobby on top of the gardening and everything else. Half the patients you've just seen have had an ankle arthrodesis and the others a replacement. I certainly can't tell the difference, can you? That's the reason that I wanted to stop it. You know, the, the thing I like about this video, and I often have shown this video to my own patients, is just that statement right there, right? You see these four people, they all have good results. Two of these people have had a fusion, two of these people have had a replacement, and yeah, I can't tell. Even, lo even looking at them walk, I can't tell who it is. Um, and that's where the ongoing controversy goes into, and we'll get into a little more about who's appropriate for one. And from my world, that's what makes it a little bit exciting is trying to figure out. And this video obviously is not that old. It's from 2015 and it's British, so you know it's very smart. Um, <laughs> and it just sums up everything really, really well and in a much nicer accent than you'll hear from me. Um, so <clears throat> for this talk, we're gonna talk a little bit more, expand a little bit about what was so elegantly said there about the anatomy and pathophysiology that's involved in the ankle and ankle arthritis. We're gonna talk about the etiologies, and about pain generation, because that's really what surgery is all about, is eliminating that pain and restoring function. We're gonna talk briefly about non-operative treatment, and then we're gonna dive in a little bit more into the surgical treatments, fusions and replacements. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, trying to figure out choosing the right treatment. Um, so what arthritis is, is a loss of cartilage. Um, and when you get this loss of cartilage, it leads to inflammation, and the inflammation leads to pain. And pain is usually with loading or movement of the joint. Um, and this can be caused by a number of different reasons. And when we think about it, we usually will think of this more as an osteoarthritis or a rheumatoid or an inflammatory type arthritis. But the end result really is the same, where you lose the cartilage. Um, and as a result of that, the nice smooth surface that normally works for these joints in order for them to move is gone and your body, it kicks up inflammation, your body signals that as pain. Um, and osteoarthritis is really the most common joint disease around. It affects 50 million Americans a year. I'm sure some people in this room suffer from this. I know I do. Um, and about 12% of osteoarthritis is the result of prior trauma. Um, but when we talk about osteoarthritis, it's important to know that different joints really are different. Uh, the mechanics are different, the arthritis patterns can be different, and the treatment, some treatments that work really well for one joint may not work as well for another joint. Um, and so if you look at acetabular fractures, about 25% of these um, will result in post-traumatic arthritis, and only about 6% of total hip arthritis is related to trauma, so the vast majority is related to um, just idiopathic wear and tear, maybe some slight um, abnormalities of the anatomy. Of the knee, 23 to 44% of tibial plateau fractures will lead to post-traumatic arthritis. But again, only about a quarter of knee arthritis is related to prior trauma. This is contrasted to the ankle where if you have a bad, what we call a pilon fracture or a plafond fracture, over 50% of those fractures will go on to getting arthritis and almost 80% or more of ankle arthritis is related to prior trauma. So the vast majority of ankle arthritis is related to prior trauma, and this can really play into um, the disease itself. So this is the ankle joint, and for anyone who's done any woodwork, they'll notice this is what we call a mortise joint. And so it has these bony blocks around the outside that, from the lateral malleolus, where the fibula is on the outside, and then the medial malleolus and the posterior malleolus, which the tibia is, and it creates this kind of U, and the talus underneath sits in that U. And this is a very stable, like in woodworking, this is a very stable joint. 
And as a result of that stability, the ankle tends to be very resistant to arthritis under normal circumstances. Actually, despite the fact that the ankle is so much further down and taking more weight than your knee, the ankle cartilage is about half the thickness of the knee. And it's because of this construct right here. Um, in addition to the bones that are helping hold this ankle together, you also have some very strong ligaments. And these ligaments you can see here, especially along that outside where the tibia meets the fibula, and these are the ligaments that are oftentimes sprained. Um, and here you can see in the back, there's some ligaments in the back. The back has less of a need for ligaments because the bone in the back of the tibia actually curves down into what we call the posterior malleolus. So the front, and the, or let's just say the back of the tibia and the back of the ankle is more stable than the front. And that's why people will tend to sprain kind of out the front. Um, and what we know is that in that stable condition, things are good. But in an unstable condition, such as when you have a fracture, or if anything causes that tibio-talar joint space to move or shift, even one millimeter, this one millimeter shift in um, the talus causes a 40% change in the loading pressures on the joint. And what happens when the loading pressures on the joint change is the cartilage doesn't like that and it will start to degenerate. Um, and so this is actually one of the more crucial orthopedic papers, at least in foot and ankle literature, to explain a lot of what we do, um, especially around ankle fractures. So here you can see in these top two images, this is an ankle fracture. And what you can see is that talus underneath has now shifted out from that nice stable mortise. There's, this is what we call a bimalleolar fracture. The malleoli, named after mallets, you can, I'm sure you've all seen them on your own ankles, those bony protrusions you have. <laughs> the one on the outside we call the lateral and the one on the inside is the medial. Um, and when these are disrupted through a fracture and the talus shifts, this is a very unstable pattern and that will almost assuredly, if we do nothing, lead to arthritis. And this is really one of the driving forces of why ankle fractures require surgery a large percentage of the time. It's to try and recreate the anatomy to make this a stable joint again. And by making it a stable joint again, you hopefully minimize the risk of arthritis down the line. One of the things that goes along with ankle fractures is that ligaments often can get torn as well. And so you can have some instability from the ligaments, or if you have multiple sprains that can happen um, where you get this instability, it can lead to arthritis as well. And the other thing that happens, even with a very stable joint, when you have arthritis like this, you can see as that talus swept out to the side, sometimes those areas of cartilage have hit each other. And just that impaction can cause a cascade to lead to arthritis later on. And so an ankle, the ankle joint itself is very resistant to arthritis under normal circumstances. But once it's disrupted, it is very susceptible to arthritis. And so this is a patient of mine, a patient of mine later, I did not treat her initial fracture. But here is her initial fracture. This is it being fixed. Ankle joint overall looks pretty good. Um, here it is about three months later, you can notice the broken screw, which means there's probably a little more movement than we may like. Here it is a little further down, they've actually removed the screw because it was causing pain. Another three months later, doing okay. Another three months, it's about six months later, okay, removed all the hardware because she's still having pain. Another six months later, cleaned it out, so she's now undergone three surgeries. Um, Keeps going, keeps going, and eventually now you can see that her joint has collapsed. Any guesses to how long this took? Five, oh, sorry, five years, right? This is a 19-year-old when this, when this injury happened. Five years later, she already has end-stage ankle arthritis to where she's basically bone on bone and rubbing. And you can imagine that this is a very painful situation. It's very debilitating. She has a young son, a very, very sweet woman. Um, and this is, can be a short amount of time, and that's why it can be a long amount of time, it can be a short amount of time, and it can be hard to predict, but we do know that fixing a fracture and fixing it well can help prevent this and help at least prolong it so, as long as possible. So post-traumatic is by far the most common reason to get arthritis of the ankle, but it's not the only reason. And like we talked about, ankle instability plays a role too. So if you have multiple bad sprains over a lifetime, if you have more than five bad sprains in a span of three years, there's one Japanese study showing that 
that really increases your risk of arthritis. And we do see plenty of people who will come and relate that, yeah, they remember having a number of bad sprains. They played college volleyball or soccer. They had a number of sprains throughout their lifetime. Um, and then presenting in their 50s or 60s, that's when the arthritis kicks in. It can be that long and that late of a, <clears throat> of a period of development. And then rheumatoid arthritis certainly can cause it. And also deformity. So if you have a congenital deformity, if you have a growth deformity due to um, illness or something else like an infection, sometimes this can lead to it as well. And so what happens with ankle arthritis? Well, the biggest symptom really is pain and the most troublesome one, right? Pain is your body's way of telling you that something is wrong. And when it's inflamed, it will stimulate those nerves around the joint to signal to your brain. It'll also get stiff. Um, the movement will be decreased. Um, you'll get swelling as a result of the inflammation and everything else. And it can also deform. It can start to go into varus or valgus, meaning turning in or turning out. Um, and it can start to contract. Um, you can develop bone spurs. Bone spurs happen in pretty much every joint in the body when there's inflammation. And it's almost like your body saying, hey, don't move that joint. And when you don't want to move the joint, how do you not move something? Well, you form bone around. You form bone around, it can't move as well. Um, and it's a result of inflammation. Sometimes even just the bone spurs themselves hitting each other can be painful. Um, but the biggest deal is pain. And really when we're thinking about treatment, that's what we're trying to solve. The main goal is really to treat pain. And so for our treatment, we often will start with anti-inflammatory medications or Tylenol. Anti-inflammatories are ibuprofen, um, Aleve, things of this nature. Tylenol is not an anti-inflammatory, but it helps with pain control. Um, by bringing down the inflammation, you can bring down the pain. And that is, that is the truth. The other thing that can be really helpful, as was mentioned in the NHS video, is a brace. And the reason for that is one of the things that really causes pain in arthritis, especially of the ankle, is not necessarily stepping on the ankle and what we call axial loading the ankle. It's actually the movement of the ankle itself and the movement of those what used to be nice, smooth, glassy surfaces that are now these rough, pockmarked surfaces. And so by minimizing the movement of the ankle, you can really help alleviate the pain. And so a good lace-up stiff brace can really be um, a godsend. And I have patients who are in these, they don't want to have surgery, they play golf, they get up, they use it every day, and it can be really, really helpful. Um, they are bulky and cumbersome, though. That's the, the downside of these, and they certainly don't work for everybody. Um, steroid injections can be helpful, just like arthritis of other joints as well. And again, this is, it's like taking a whole bottle of that ibuprofen and shoving it right into the joint. And it really cuts down the inflammation very, very well. Uh, the downside, of course, is that these are temporary. So once the effect of that steroid is gone, then things will um, uh, creep back to where they were previously. And the steroid injections are very variable. Some people get great response from it. They can have three to six months of excellent pain relief. Some people get a few days, some people get a few weeks, and you don't always know until you try. Um, I have another slide next, PRP and stem cells. They're very expensive and they haven't been proven to work. Um, and then as the NHS uh, <clears throat> narrator talked about, when these non-operative treatments have failed and when um, the arthritis is debilitating enough to really cause an impact in people's lives, that's when we start talking about surgery. And just a quick note on stem cells, because obviously the popular media loves talking about stem cells. It's a it was buzzword. So I'm gonna talk about it. Um, stem cells are cells that really have the potential to differentiate into other cell types. And this has huge promise, because the idea is that these cells can heal. If these cells can turn into other cells, we can turn these cells into articular cartilage cells. We can turn these cells into heart cells, into brain cells, and we can solve a lot of the problems and heal a lot of these lesions. So it's theoretically possible to drive them to repair or replace damaged tissue. That's the promise. That's why they're so exciting. That's why so much money is being spent. That's why they, you know, they gave us $30 million to build that building behind us because the promise is so huge. Today's reality is that it's very hard to get stem cells to act like we want them to. Trust me, I know. 
I spent a year of my life as a resident trying to get articular cartilage to do what I wanted to do, and they are stubborn as a mule. Um, and articular cartilage is particularly stubborn. It's particularly susceptible. Um, it doesn't like to live. Articular cartilage itself is a highly structured substance that not only does the cells matter, but the extracellular matrix around it and how it's oriented really matters. And trying to develop that is very tough. Um, and so the idea that you're going to inject these cells into this environment and they are going to automatically go and do and heal this one particular thing, it just doesn't work that way. Not yet. And so as a result, these, this is really expensive and unproven to this point because we haven't figured out how to give those cells the right signal to get them to do what they do. And maybe 10 years from now, if I give this talk again, that statement will be very different, and I hope it is. But for right now, they're just not yet ready for prime time. And there are all kinds of small studies and anecdotal stories and YouTube videos and Facebook pages of people that will say stem cells were a miracle and they cured everything, but there are no good large studies actually demonstrating that. Um, and so I cannot recommend them. So when those other treatment options have failed and you're thinking, gosh, this is uh, really impeding my life, then the next step is surgery. And we do have good surgical options for this problem. Um, you know, two of the surgical options I'm just gonna talk about briefly because they are options. One is debridement. And debridement just means cleaning. Um, and this is really reserved for patients who either have a very isolated area of arthritis, what we call osteochondral defects or small lesions that we can somehow get to or something like bone spurs, and it's actually the rubbing of the bone spurs more so than the joint arthritis that's causing pain, it's not good for widespread disease. And this is really for every joint. Just cleaning out the joint when you have widespread disease will temporarily give decent relief, just like the steroid injection, but eventually people are back to being the same. Um, and so it's only really recommended for very specific uh, instances. <clears throat> There is a procedure called a supramalleolar osteotomy. I'll show you a, uh, a demonstration of it on the next slide. And this is really for people who have deformity and pain in their ankle as a result of the deformity, but the joint itself is actually pretty good. And then we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about fusion and replacement. So this is a patient of mine. Um, he's a 45-year-old gentleman, super nice guy. I actually saw him in clinic today, he happened to come in. Um, he works at a pizza parlor, it's on his feet all day. He has a condition called multiple hereditary exostoses, where he forms these outcroppings of bone and cartilage. And as a result of that, he had a kind of a partial fusion of this syndesmosis joint, which is the space between the tibia and the fibula. And as a result of that, his ankle was twisted as he was growing. So this has been what his ankle has looked like. He's now in his mid 40s. This is what it's looked like since he was a teenager. And you can see that actually the joint space looks okay, it's just kind of at an angle. Um, and so for these people, we don't necessarily have to do anything to the joint itself. What we're able to do is actually make cuts into the bone to realign that joint. And this is a very specific instance, and I've done two of these in five years of being a foot and ankle surgeon, so it's, it's really quite rare that these come up, but it is a possibility. And so, but a rare one. And so to get on to really the main topic after that intro, let's dive in, dive in a little bit to talk about fusion versus replacement. Uh, what are the good things, the bad things about each one? How does one make a choice? How do I make a choice? How do my patients make choices? Um, and go through that. So as was stated earlier, an ankle fusion is removing the ankle joint itself, removing all that cartilage and turning the tibia and the talus into one solid bone. Um, this is done by opening the ankle up, removing the cartilage, and then screws or a plate and screws are then placed to hold those bones together um, once that bond or that bone fuses together. It's only to hold it there temporarily, and so once the bone fuses, the hardware is superfluous, and it can actually come out if need be. Um, usually it does not. Sometimes we'll even put bone graft, either from a cadaver or from the patient themselves, into the space, especially if those surfaces are not completely together and there's any kind of a void, you could put graft in the middle and your body will actually grow across that scaffolding in order to fuse those two bones together. This is a very, very old technique. This is over 120 years old. It's a very, has a very good and proven track record, 
but it does come with some compromises. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. Postoperatively, this is what it typically looks like. This can be done, believe it or not, as an outpatient. Um, you can send people home the same day. Oftentimes people will stay overnight uh, in the hospital or a day or two. Usually you're in a splint or a cast um, for anywhere from six to 12 weeks. And this is to help hold the ankle uh, motionless, again, to allow those bony cells to fuse, to find their brothers and sisters across on the other side of the joint and fuse together. And you need to be off of it to allow that to happen as well, usually for anywhere from six weeks to three months. Fully fusing takes on average about three to six months, but I've seen it take up to two years sometimes. Um, and then once fusion is achieved, you can really do anything. Um, meaning that it is a solid bone. It's not gonna break, it'll be there, and it'll be fused for life. So once things actually fuse, you really can't do anything safely. People are not generally doing these things, however. So though you can run, very few people run. Though you can jump, very few people jump. The more likely activities are what you saw in that video, walking, hiking, swimming, biking. Those things are all quite doable and quite possible. Running, jumping, high level athletic activities, especially sprinting, are really difficult and, and really unlikely after this. So what are the results of this? Well, actually 75 to 85% of people will have good pain relief. Usually it's not complete pain relief, though it can be. For a lot of people, it'll be good pain relief to where they get to where their pain is on average, say on a scale of one to 10 and eight, down to a two or three. So people still have some pain, but it's much more manageable and they're able to live their life. So about half of people will still have some pain. You do lose about three quarters of your sagittal motion. So bringing your ankle up and down, that dorsiflexion, plantar flexion motion. You don't lose all of it because some of it is taken up by the other joints that are around, the other hind foot joints, what we call Chopard's joint and the subtalar joint. And we also know that when you fuse the ankle, these joints tend to move a little bit more than they would normally. Um, you also lose a little bit of your inversion and eversion, meaning bringing your foot in and bringing your foot out. But you still can move, so it's not that your foot is completely stiff. As we saw in the video, you know, people can walk, you can still move a bit, but you do definitely lose motion. Um, and so what are the potential complications that go with this? Probably the biggest one is actually number two right here, which is the adjacent joint arthritis. As I just stated, those other joints will move more when you fuse the ankle, but as a result of them moving more, it also means that they're seeing much more stress. And by seeing that those increased stresses, they are much more likely to degenerate themselves. So about 25 to 50% of people will actually see the joints around uh, start to degenerate. And this can happen relatively short period of time or a relatively long period of time. And again, it's kind of highly variable. We say five to 15 years. I've seen it happen within two and I've seen it take 30. So um, it's, it can be a little bit difficult to predict. Um, one of the tough parts that we constantly fight as a surgeon is we do our darndest to get these to heal and to fuse together, but they don't always. And about one out of six or about 15% of people will not fully fuse. About half of those people won't, will be asymptomatic. They won't feel it or have any pain. And those people we can kind of leave alone, but seven, seven and a half to 10% or so as a result of them not fusing will continue to have pain. And that sometimes means you have to have a second operation to try and get it to fuse after that. Um, people do walk with a decreased gait velocity, so they walk slower. And as a result of that loss of motion, both up and down and in and out, uneven surfaces and stairs and hills can be a little bit tougher because your foot doesn't have quite the motion to accommodate those uneven surfaces that are there. One thing I didn't put up on here, infection with any surgery we do is a risk. And the infection rate is about one or 2%. And that usually happens early on. It's really rare once you get a fusion to get an infection later on. It does happen, but it's exceedingly rare. If it happens, it usually happens early. 
So I'm going to go through just a couple of examples, and these are examples taken from my own clinic. These are my own patients. Obviously, no names or faces. Um, just to kind of talk a little bit about you know uh, what this looks like. So. This is a very nice 62-year-old man. He's had 10 years of ankle pain. He's a migrant worker in the Central Valley, and he's been out of work for the last uh, three years. You can imagine that if you're working in the fields, having a bad ankle is a bad situation. And so his family's actually been supporting him. This is a really tough situation for him, obviously. He really wants to get back to work. He vaguely remembers having an ankle fracture when he was a teenager um, in Central America. Uh, he's not sure. It, you know, He thinks it was treated in the cast. Um, definitely didn't have surgery. And he's tried braces, um, ibuprofen, but nothing really has seemed to do a good job with his ankle pain. And here are his two x-rays right here. And what you can see, especially on this one on the right, one, he's kind of collapsed into what we call varus. So he's kind of collapsed inward. And the medial side, the inside of his joint is completely collapsed down with bone on bone, end stage, stage four arthritis. And you can see on the lateral view um, on the right side over here, there's some extra bone that's kind of formed in the front, um, what we call a bone spur right on the front of his talus. So as you can imagine, this is a very um, painful situation for him. He has a job that is high demand, on his feet a lot, really wants to get back to it. So after we had the discussion of everything, we went through and did give him an ankle fusion. Um, and in this regard, the nice part about doing an ankle fusion here is we're actually able to correct that um, various deformity. We're able to pull him back out into a better position. We did cut his fibula, but then we put it back. And this is actually his uh, <coughs> images from when he saw me back at three months. He has a nice solid fusion on his radiographs. And he actually came to the office, very stoked man, and hugged me because he was so happy. His ankle felt so good. And actually got back to work. So I was incredibly proud. Um, it's tough to get people back to work. And he was so motivated. He was back to work by six months. Um, I was really impressed. Very, very nice guy. And thankfully, he's doing really well the last time I saw him. Um, this is another gentleman. This is a 69-year-old man. Here you can see that he had previous trauma and also had a previous um, attempt to fix that trauma. So you can see he's got all of these screws. These little kind of lines around are what we call endo buttons. And so these are buttons that are trying to hold the joint together. There's suture that goes in between them, trying to hold, really kind of trying to replace ligaments that were torn at the same time as well. Uh, and the trouble here that I had the discussion with him is that that hardware is starting to erode down into his joint. And as a result, if you take that hardware out, there's gonna be a lot of bone loss. And so the architecture and the anatomy that's there is just not great. Um, and so we talked about this and also elected to undergo a fusion. And what happened here literally took everything away. By the time we took everything out, there was a lot of loss and I actually had to use a saw to make cuts in order to get his bone surfaces to touch each other to where they might be able to heal. And then we used the other bone that we cut away as bone graft to put it back. And here he is at six weeks. Um, and don't know why I don't have his three-month and six-month photos, but he also did quite well as well. This was a guy who was in a wheelchair prior to seeing me um, and now was getting up at least and starting to walk. And so another gentleman who did quite well um, with a fusion. So good results are definitely possible with a fusion. Um, and as is the theme from the NHS, as will be a theme when I talk about later, it really is an individual choice between patient and surgeon which one is going to be better. And like all of medicine, this is something that really should be individualized, individual anatomy, individual goals, and all of that, because that's where you get the best results. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about replacement, because it's newer, and there's a little bit more to kind of, kind of unfold um, from a technical standpoint. But a joint replacement is putting an artificial joint in, and this is metal and plastic, and this has been around for years and years and years. People have started replacing hips. Um, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, so I won't say, but it's been popular for uh, 40 plus years when Sir John Charlie started doing it and have done really quite well. Um, and we, the same concepts have been brought to the ankle. Um, the surgery is, again, outpatient or overnight in the hospital, usually in a splint for two weeks, and usually non weight bearing for two to six weeks. One of the nice parts about ankle replacements is that you are able to let people walk on them earlier because you're not trying to get 
the bone to fuse across that space. And you're just trying to get the bone to bond onto the surfaces of the replacement. And when you walk, you're actually pushing your bone onto the replacement. You can let people walk earlier. Usually you just need to let their wounds heal and then you're able to let them walk. Full recovery can be similar, uh, anywhere from three to six months. And you do maintain your motion, but I do caution people, you do not gain motion. So what you come in with, you usually leave with, unlike with the fusion, but it's rare that you gain any meaningful motion, maybe just a few degrees. Um, and then once the uh, bone has healed down on the prosthesis, non-impactivities are possible. So I really advise against jumping, running, these sort of things. We really worry that the impact is too much for the prosthesis to handle. Um, but non-impact activities, yeah, biking, swimming, hiking, you know, weightlifting, Pilates, yoga, all those things are possible and people do it. I have patients that go up and down ladders. I have patients that are working in more um, uh, vigorous jobs and that's not a problem. But the leaving your foot, jumping, running, uh, we don't advise. Um, so what are the potential complications with ankle replacements? Well, you can get loosening of the components. This is a mechanical thing. Um, and part of how it works is for the bone to actually heal down onto the prosthesis itself. But sometimes the bone doesn't fully heal down onto the prosthesis. And sometimes it heals initially, but over time, that good bond can wear away. Um, the plastic in the middle can break um, in one type of prosthesis happens about 3% of the time, so it's pretty rare, and often even out to 10 years. Again, infection is about 1% to 2%, and you do still have some people that continue to have some pain, although it tends to be a little bit less um, than the fusion itself. These numbers, I would hesitate to compare this directly to that fusion because these are different studies. They're not from the same study, so I'm not sure that's a complete apples-to-apples -apples comparison. I apologize about that. Apologize, and it's because we don't have an apples to apples comparison. And that's what that TARVA study is hopefully going to do for us. So, a little bit about the history. So, the first prosthesis was really an inverted hip prosthesis. So, they were saying, ah, these hip replacements are doing quite well. What if we just turned it upside down, used the ball as the tibia, kind of reamed out, made a little core in the talus, and used that? As you might uh, imagine, that was, this was a spectacular failure. Different joints are different, and they require different. Uh, adherence to their anatomy and to their biomechanics that go on. Um, in 1982, Newton said that the results of total ankle in rheumatoid arthritis were so poor that he thought it was contraindicated, meaning that it was basically malpractice to do this. Bolton and Maggs in 85 thought that arthrodesis treatment was the absolute treatment of choice for arthritis, regardless of the underlying conditions. So they said, you know what? Ankle replacements are so bad, arthritis is always better, no matter what. And then in 1996, so not even that long ago, uh, Katoka reviewed <clears throat> 160 angle replacements and they had a 36%, so one in three early failure rate. And this is failure within the first two to three years. And that's a really unacceptable rate. I mean, if, if one third of your patients need a reoperation within the first couple of years, we really got to wonder about what we're doing. Thankfully, this is 20 years ago. Um, these early prostheses were poorly designed. We were using a poor technique. Part of it is definitely on us, the surgeons. And we were not good at figuring out which patients were going to be better for the replacement versus fusion and that sort of thing. So this is where all of these things are getting better over time. We are definitely have better designs. We have improved our technique and we continue to improve um, our patient selection. This is one of the early designs. I can tell you about the problem. This is, this is actually an agility, which was a decent design. The problem here is you might be able to see on the tailor side is it kind of sits in the middle of the talus. And these would have tendency to just sink into the middle of the talus. Um, so if they held up, they held up fine. But a lot of times these would need to be revised. Um, and part of my fellowship, a large part of my fellowship was revising these that had been put in um, in the 10 years prior to me getting there. Um, so modern total ankle designs we really are and have learned from the mistakes of the past. Most of our components we use today are three components. They have a metallic base plate that's fixed to the tibia, um, a dome-shaped metallic component for the talus, again, trying to recreate that domed arc, um, and then a bearing surface of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, so a very, very strong plastic. And this is very similar to knees, shoulders, 
elbows, hips. This design has kind of withstood the test of time and has shown to be uh, to have quite good results. Um, there's two types of systems in the ankle. One is what we call a fixed bearing system. And this is where the plastic is actually adhered. It usually kind of uh, sticks into the tibial component. And then the motion still happens, but the motion happens just between that poly, the plastic and the tailor component. Um, and then there's also what's known as a mobile bearing system. And this is where the plastic is actually not fixed. It just sits between the two. And this allows freedom at both surfaces. Um, well, okay, so which one of these is better? Um, well, we'll get into that in a second, but there's a number of different ankle arthroplasties that are available in the United States these days. The top one, the Agility, I believe they're not making anymore. I think they're still servicing them, so if you had one in before and you need components for a revision surgery, they'll do it, but I don't think they're making new ones anymore, but all the rest of these are still in use and have all actually been shown to be pretty good with relatively similar results, to be quite honest. And so that's where I'm gonna talk a little bit about the STAR system. This is, I'm gonna talk about this one because we kind of have the most data, data on it because it is um, the oldest of this generation. Um, so there's five different tibial sizes, which is nice. It means you get a, again, look at your patient's anatomy, really size it appropriately for which one um, it's gonna be. Um, it has a poly that's up to 14 millimeters thick, which means that you have a good amount of distance to play with if you have bone loss. And it has this titanium plasma spray coating, which helps the bone adhere to it. Um, and it does. So the STAR system has the, it was, is the most used in history. And I think that's still the case. Um, meaning that the most have been put in around the world. The one that was in Europe for a while actually had a different coating on the, uh, on the prostheses, and that one actually had worse results. So the one that's in the United States was the better one, um, and that was just a, a company thing in, in, in kind of how they were selling it, and so we kind of lucked out in that regard. Um, and so you can see that what you do in order to get this done, as you show here, we use this extra medullary jig and the extra medullary guide really helps us to line up the prosthesis and make sure that we're getting it exactly where we want it to go in the tibia. And as a result of that, the star has been shown really to have good results overall with a 90% likelihood for this to be last 10 years or longer. All right, so getting back to that two or three piece design, we said that you know this is the three piece design and some people have suggested that maybe having a little more motion in the star is a good thing and that's why it's been so good and you know it re relieves a lot of stress in that area. And others believe that uh, the wear rate actually is worse in that component because those multiple surfaces add to multiple areas where it can be problematic. Um, but the clinical results really don't necessarily bear that out. So the five prostheses that I talked about previously, the results are all pretty similar. So a lot of what I'm extrapolating from the data on the star, we can extrapolate to the other prostheses. That's not 100% accurate, but you can think of it that way. Um, and I bring this up only because if any of you or your friends and family need to have a replacement and you wanna to talk to your surgeon about which one they use, you can feel relatively comfortable that of these modern designs, they do have similar results. Um, <clears throat> and again, this is a five-year data basically showing that no difference between the two and the three-piece designs. So results of STAR in the US, and this is from Roger Mann, who's actually come back to faculty here. He's a gentleman who trained here. He literally writes the book on foot and ankle surgery, and he's had a private practice in Oakland for the last 40 years. And he was the one who actually brought this prosthesis to the United States um, from Europe. Um, so this was looking at two surgeons, and the average follow-up of this was, was nine years. And what they found was that 91%, again, of these prostheses remain implanted at 9.1 years. And the probability of survival at, at five years was actually 96%. Um, so overall, these were doing quite good. Um, and these people had an average 39 point improvement in their outcome scores and 92% of these patients were satisfied. And you can imagine which patients weren't satisfied, probably the patients that had to have them revised and that's typically, typically the case. So the overall results were quite good. This is not that 36% had to be revised within the first two to three years. This is we're getting 10 years and maybe 10% 
have to be revised. So this is a much more acceptable result of what we as surgeons and definitely people as patients want to see. Um, again, this is a different study. Um, this is actually out of Duke uh, with Jim Nunley. 82 patients evaluated, um, mean follow-up again, five years. And this was really to kind of better document the outcome. And what they found was there was significant improvement in all outcome categories between the preoperative and postoperative evaluations. Um, five patients in this five-year period needed to have a revision, and that's pretty close to Dr. Mann's. His was about 4%. This is about 6%. Um, there were six polyethylene liner exchanges. Three were because of fracture, um, and three, basically, if you go in and remove osteophytes or something else, because people are having bone spurs that start to rub after, the, after this procedure, oftentimes we'll change the poly. It's like kind of, if you imagine the poly over time will kind of wear down. So anytime you're in there, you put in a new poly, it's kind of like popping new tires on. Um, kind of just might as well do it. So overall, these were really quite good results and very encouraging. Um, and so as a result of that, people have, a result of studies like these over the last 20 years, um, foot and ankle surgeons around the country have started to do more and more foot and ankle arthroplasties. And so you can imagine that what happened is fusion had been around for a long time. In the 70s, these early designs came out and people started using them, but then the results were bad, so people shied away from it and went back to fusion, which is a good surgery. And now as the good results of these newer designs have come out and then demonstrated, talked about in meetings, replicated in multiple studies, now a lot of us have moved back towards um, performing more foot and ankle, uh, more arthroplasties, and that's part of where that NHS study comes in. Okay, now it looks like we have procedures that are on equal footing, let us find out which one is truly the better one so we can, and for which patients, so we can advise and help our patients better. So a couple of examples of uh, arthroplasty here. This first woman is an 87-year-old woman who, I mean, one, if I lived 87, that'd be amazing. And if I look half as good as this woman looks, that would be uh, truly amazing. She looks like she's 70. Really amazing woman. Um, so she's tried lace-up bracing with little help and really wants to continue to wear heels. She told me she had to wear heels. And that means fusion's out. I didn't talk about that, but you're, you're not wearing high heels with the fusion. Um, she does stand with a slight valgus, and this valgus you actually can correct. So she's got some mobility in her ankle joint itself, and here's her uh, x-rays. And x-rays are not the worst, but you can see the collapse of the joint onto that lateral side, onto the outside of the joint. And so she got an ankle replacement. This is her at six weeks. This is her at one year, and she was happy. And yes, she walked into my office wearing high heels, um, which is amazing. I didn't advise it, but she did it. <laughs> um, this is a second patient of mine. So this is a 70-year-old man. He's had f greater than four years of left ankle pain. And this is, a, this is a typical pattern where I ask him, you know, any fractures? And he says, no. I was like, well, yeah, I had any injuries. Yeah, you know, back when I was in the service, you know, in the 60s, I, you know, remember spraining my ankle a couple times. But, you know, throughout my adult life, it was fine. It was really in the last four years it started hurting. And that's not an uncommon scenario um, of patients coming in. Um, the year before, he had actually had an outside podiatrist had attempted to reconstruct the ligaments on the outside because those were the ligaments that were torn during these sprains, hoping that this would help but it didn't, and his foot kind of immediately went back. Um, and really, honestly, he just had too much arthritis for that to work. Um, and so here are his x-rays here, and again, you can see he's tilted in, he's got a lot of this varus deformity. Um, his foot is really kind of tilted in, and when you look at him, he's kind of walking out to the side. Um, and he's really quite debilitated as a result of this. So this person has a little more deformity even. And in the early parts of ankle replacements, we would have said this is too much deformity to do a replacement. Because when you have a lot of deformity, it can be hard to get the replacement to sit in the proper orientation. And if it doesn't sit in the proper orientation, it'll wear out faster. So I'd say, I would argue that five years ago, if you went to one of our national meetings, most of the people would have said, yeah, you have to fuse that. If you do a replacement, they won't do well. And that tide is changing a little bit too, and it's changing because what we've learned to do is some of these auxiliary procedures. Sometimes you can do things to correct the bone and the joints around the ankle to better balance the ankle and to correct some of that and get it back in. And so I bet 
if you went to one of our meetings this summer, next summer, most of the people you talked to would say that they would actually replace that ankle. And so this is what we did. We did a, what's called a closing wedge osteotomy. So you actually bring that first toe up a little bit and that helps to get rid of some of that tilt that he has back. And then we did an ankle replacement. Here he is at six months and he says his ankles feel the best it has in, in 10 years. And he was very, very happy with it, with his result. Um, what I hope you can see from my examples of the ankle fusion and the ankle replacement and what the NHS video shows is that good results are possible on either end for sure. Um, and choosing which one really does become a individualized choice between patient and physician, individual anatomy, pathology, goals, all of that. So, all right, so who may do better one versus the other? And I would, I would argue that a lot of this is not absolute. Some of this is debatable. Um, so fusion, younger patients tend to do better. Why is that? Well, you know, for younger patients, if you are 24, like my um, unfortunate woman who had her ankle fracture, you're hopefully gonna live 50, 60, 70 more years. That ankle fusion will last forever. A mechanical ankle that plastic will not last forever. And so likely you're gonna need multiple revisions at some point in the future. Like any mechanical thing, the car doesn't last forever, but a living, breathing tissue can last as long as you do because it will constantly heal itself. Um, and that's why for younger patients, and so where's that cutoff? And the answer is just like hips and knees, it's getting younger and younger every year as we get more comfortable doing replacements and the revision of replacements, that number is really changing. For me, that number is about 50 years old, but I've done ankle replacements in people that are 49 and 48, and so that number is creeping down, and it'll continue to creep down. Um, people who have higher impact jobs, someone who says, I'm absolutely gonna run and jump, I'm gonna rock climb, I'm gonna jump on this thing, that's maybe not someone who um, will do well with a replacement, but a fusion can be okay. People that have really, really bad deformities, um, that's where fusion, um, probably most of the time these days, that's the people that get the fusions or the young people, or extensive bone loss. If you can't fit the prosthesis in there, then you need to do infusion. And if you've had a prior infection in that joint, that's another sticky area because if you do get an infection and you have an ankle replacement in there, that can be a real problem because sometimes it means you have to actually take out the entirety of the ankle replacement. So sometimes a fusion might be a better option there. So the people who do better with replacements, people who are a little older, people who are doing lower impact activities, minimal deformity, good bone, and that sometimes people that have arthritis of the surrounding joints do better with a replacement. And the reason for that is if you go back and remember that if you fuse an ankle, you're gonna put more stress on the surrounding joints. So you can imagine if you fuse an ankle and you already have arthritis of your subtalar joint, that's likely to get more painful. And so for a lot of people, um, a replacement will relieve a little bit of stress on those joints or at least not make it worse. Um, so then, okay, so what if all things are equal? Well, the jury's still out on that, honestly. And that's where that NHS study comes in, um, really trying to hash that out and figure out which one is the best. Um, and I think what honest answer is, is that no one thing is the best for any, everybody, but one thing might be better for an individual. And I do think, as cliche as it sounds, you know, the individualized choice is the right choice uh, in this situation. But there have been studies that have tried to look at this, of course, um, because we all wanna know. And so this was a review article and it looked at a number of articles that are out in the literature. And what they showed is that complication rates between fusion and replacement were similar, but the overall complication rates were actually slightly higher in fusion However, the overall reoperation rate was slightly higher in replacement. And so this just kind of determines, okay, what did you call a complication versus, you know, if your poly, if the plastic breaks at 10 years, we don't necessarily call that a complication, but it does require a, a repeat operation to fix it. Or if your ankle replacement, the bone uh, around the replacement itself loosens over that period of time, then we don't call that a complication. So. <clears throat> Slightly higher reoperation rate. But as you might imagine, the slightly better gait mechanics with a replacement. 
And again, the, what these people recommended, which you'll hear over and over again, is they recommended individualized care for the patient based on their own um, anatomy and goals and pathology and everything else. So to wrap everything up, the three things I think I, I want you guys to take away, and if, if you only take away three things, one is that good outcomes really are possible with both fusion and replacement, and the choice really should be individualized to the individual patient's anatomy and goals. Um, and if you had to hold my feet over the fire, all things being equal, replacements do seem to do a little bit better. Um, that's my opinion, my observation of seeing my patients on how they do. Patients ask me all the time, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? And it definitely matters, the anatomy, the bone stock, the youth, all of that. But if all things were equal and both were an option, um, I think the replacements do do a little bit better. But, big caveat, that has not yet been definitively proven, and the reoperation rate probably is a little bit higher, but I think that they're a little bit happier. Um, so that's my uh, not scientifically proven yet, but my own opinion if I have to leave with it. Um, so with that, I'll thank you. <laughs>